In this lesson, we're continuing our discussion of mutual assent. At this point, we've talked about how an offer is formed, how an offer is terminated, and even how an offer is accepted. But in this lesson, we want to focus on the exact moment in time that an acceptance becomes valid. And we'll talk about why this is important, but before we get into that, how do we go about forming a traditional enforceable contract? As a quick refresher, right? Remember, we have three elements. We need mutual assent between the parties, consideration, and no defenses to formation that would invalidate the otherwise valid contract. In case you're wondering where we are in today's lesson, in our big picture flow of the contract law analysis, we're still right here under formation on the M in my cats do sneak, which of course stands for mutual assent. And again, what is mutual assent? Remember, mutual assent is just this idea that in order to form a traditional enforceable contract, we need a meeting of the minds between the parties. And how do we make this determination on a contract law fact pattern? Again, we need to determine whether we have a valid offer and a valid acceptance of that offer. If we find that we have an offer and acceptance, we say we have mutual assent between the parties. And again, at this point, we've talked about how an offer is formed, how an offer can be terminated, and how an offer can be validly accepted, which was, of course, the topic in our last video. So today, in this lesson, we're moving on and talking about the timeline. Remember our offer acceptance timeline? We want to be able to identify on a contract law fact pattern the moment in time that an acceptance becomes effective. And this is important because the acceptance is governed by a slightly different test. We have this thing called the mailbox rule that applies to acceptances that are sent by mail, email, or fax. Now, Remember, up until this point, all of our communications that we've talked about in contract law, whether it's the offer, the counter offer, the rejection, the revocation, remember all of the ways that we've talked about the parties interacting, whether it's terminating the offer, forming the offer, right? What have we said? When do those things become valid, right? Remember, whether it's an express revocation, a counter offer, all the things to terminate an offer, or even the offer formation itself. All of those things become valid when it is received by the other party, right? When you send an express revocation by mail, nothing happens if you're the offeror. Say that I, just to give us a baseline example, again, we'll stick with what we've gone with. Say that I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. If I want to revoke my offer and I want to do it by mail, Right? I can write a revocation letter. I can say I'm revoking my offer for $5. I put that in the mailbox and nothing happens. That revocation is not going to become effective until you receive it on the other end. Right? It has to be communicated. That was our number one rule with express revocations. Remember, it has to be communicated to the other side. And this would apply to rejections, to counter offers, to any form of a termination that's being expressly communicated to the other side. It only becomes effective when the other side receives it. Now, the acceptance is a little bit different than these other forms of communication. Remember, the acceptance is governed by this rule that we have that was a common law rule that's been adopted by the UCC. So it doesn't matter what universe we're in, common law or UCC, we're applying the mailbox rule to acceptances that are sent by mail, email, or fax. So what is the rule? Well, the starting point rule is very, very simple. One of the easiest rules you'll ever learn in contract law. An acceptance that is sent by mail, email, or fax becomes effective at the moment of dispatch. Unless, and we have all of these exceptions that we'll talk about in a minute. But just to break this down, what does this mean, right? Absent the exceptions, an acceptance sent by mail, email, or fax becomes effective at the moment of dispatch. What this means is if I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5 and you wish to accept my offer and you wish to do so by writing me a letter of acceptance, okay? When you write that letter and you put it in the envelope and you address it properly to me and you put the stamp on it and then you drive to the post office, the moment that that letter leaves your fingertips and starts to fall into the mailbox. At that 
moment of dispatch, that moment in time, the acceptance becomes effective. And what you should instantly realize, and why this analysis can be confusing sometimes and a little counterintuitive, is because we have a valid acceptance in time before the offeror even knows it exists, right? An acceptance that's just been dropped in the mailbox. The offeror hasn't seen it, he hasn't received it, but that doesn't matter, right? Unless an exception applies, that acceptance is valid. It's effective the moment you drop it in the mailbox. So you can see why in contract law, this can create a lot of very interesting or counterintuitive fact patterns. Because we have a situation where we have mutual assent between the parties. We have offer and acceptance, and the offeror doesn't even know that the acceptance exists. Yet we're still saying we have a meeting of the minds, right? So that's what kind of makes the mailbox rule interesting. But at its core, you shouldn't think about you know, why it's weird or why it's counterintuitive. You should just apply it like a robot, right? Don't think about it as from the offeror's point of view or this or that, right? Literally, just remember when that acceptance letter is put in the mailbox, it leaves the offeree's hands and it starts to fall in the mailbox. Acceptance is effective unless one of these five exceptions applies. Okay, so let's talk about the exceptions and then let's look at some examples. Okay, so our first exception is going to occur when the offeree has the wrong address or improper postage. So in that example, if the offeree has written his acceptance letter and he's putting it in the envelope, but he gets the wrong address, right? And then he puts that in the mailbox, nothing's going to happen, right? Or he forgets to put a stamp on it and then he puts it in the mailbox. Nothing's gonna happen, right? If you have the wrong address or improper postage, mailbox rule does not apply. Right? And what happens if the mailbox rule does not apply? Right? Does that just mean the acceptance is automatically invalid? No. Right? What happens is we say, okay, if the mailbox rule doesn't apply, then the acceptance is effective upon receipt. Right? So the acceptance is either going to be effective at dispatch, right, when it leaves the offeree's fingertips and drops into the mailbox, or it's going to be effective upon the offeror's receipt of the acceptance. It has to be one or the other, right? It's not gonna be some other point in time. So if we are saying, if one of these exceptions applies, we're not saying that the acceptance is invalid, we're just saying that it's going to be effective at the moment that the offeror receives it, okay? So even if the offeree puts the wrong address on it or forgets to put a stamp on it, it's still going to become effective when and if it reaches the offeror, right? If the offeror receives it later, that's when it becomes effective, okay? But this is our first exception that essentially disables the mailbox rule. Our next exception is when the offeror stipulates, stipulates otherwise, right? The offeror, remember, is master of the offer. So the offeror can simply turn the mailbox rule off, right? He can disable it by including in the terms of his offer. Remember, the offeror is master of the offer. So if the offeror says that acceptance is effective upon receipt, then the mailbox rule does not apply, okay? So these two exceptions are pretty easy so far, right? Our third exception, again, is pretty binary, pretty easy. If we're dealing with an option contract, the mailbox rule does not apply to option contracts. Remember, we've talked about option contracts in our last couple videos, right? The option contract is a situation where the offeree is paying additional consideration to have the option to purchase something at a later date, right? It's a type of irrevocable offer and the mailbox rule does not apply to option contracts. Just a very binary exception to commit to memory. Then our fourth and fifth exceptions are kind of the big ones, right? That we really want to remember and think about because this is where I see a lot of mistakes happen, right? So the fourth exception to the mailbox rule, where we don't apply the mailbox rule, we say the acceptance becomes effective upon receipt, not dispatch, is number four. The offeree sends a termination letter before the acceptance letter. 
Okay, so if the offeree sends something else first that terminates the offer, and then he sends the acceptance letter, the rule is the acceptance becomes effective upon receipt. Okay, so if the offeror receives a termination letter before the acceptance letter, then the offer is terminated. We do not have mutual assent. We don't have offer and acceptance. Okay, so we'll look at some timelines here in a second. We'll look at some examples. So don't worry about it. We're gonna talk about this in a lot of detail, right? Just remember if the offeree sends a letter that terminates the offer, which is usually either going to be a counter offer or a rejection letter, if he sends a rejection or a counter offer before he sends the acceptance letter, then the mailbox rule does not apply. And the acceptance becomes effective upon the offer ruler's receipt, right? But if the offer ruler receives a termination letter before acceptance, remember we talked about what happens when we have a termination of the offer before acceptance, right? Once an offer is dead, it, once an offer is terminated, it is dead, it can't be accepted, right? Which is why this timeline over here becomes really important. Talk about that in a second. Our fifth and final exception we want to think about to the mailbox rule is when the offeror detrimentally relies on a termination letter before he receives the acceptance letter. Okay, this one is maybe the most complicated because this, we're saying still, the offeree can still send an acceptance letter first, right? Offeree sends the acceptance letter first, then he sends a termination letter, right? But the offeror receives that termination letter first before he receives the acceptance letter. And then the offeror detrimentally relies on that termination letter before he receives the acceptance letter. In that case, we're going to say that the acceptance becomes valid upon receipt. And if he received a termination letter first, then we do not have offer and acceptance. Can't have mutual assent. A contract, a traditional enforceable contract cannot exist without mutual assent, okay? So let's look at some examples. I know just talking about it, it can be a little bit confusing. So for these examples, let's just assume that any acceptance being sent meets all the validity requirements, right? So the offeree has the power of acceptance and the offeree is, accepted, is accepting in accordance with the terms established by the offeror who is master of the offer. So let's just say that these acceptances and these examples being sent are valid, even though in your analysis or on your analysis on a contract law fact pattern, you'd always want to double check that any acceptance being sent by the offeree number meets both of those elements. Number one, that the offeree has the actual power of acceptance, and number two, that the offeree is manifesting acceptance in accordance with the terms established by the offeror, who is master of the offer, right? Which we talked about in our last video. But focusing on the timeline in the mailbox rule, let's just assume that these acceptances being sent are otherwise valid, okay? So let's look at this first, right? This example right here illustrates the mailbox rule in its most basic form and basically how it operates, right? So the offeror, so in, and by the way, just as a quick key for you guys, these blue arrows mean that the party is sending something. The green little return arrows mean that the party is receiving something, okay? So right here, the offeror, step one in any fact pattern, right? Offeror sends the offer. So we can just, if we want an offer in our heads, let's talk about purchase or sale of this $5 dry erase marker. I can be the offeror, you can be the offeree, right? So I send you an offer to purchase this dry erase marker for $5. You receive that offer. You, the offeree, send me an acceptance letter, right? You write me a letter saying, Michael, I accept your offer to purchase the dry erase marker for $5. You address it properly, you put your stamp on it, you go to the post office and you drop it in the mailbox, okay? And then let's say 10 minutes later, you realize you made a mistake. You do not actually want to accept my letter. You do not actually want to accept my offer. So. 
you write a rejection letter. You think quick and you're like, okay, you know what? I can still overnight a rejection letter and that'll get to Michael before my acceptance letter. So you go back, you write a rejection letter. Michael, I affirmatively reject your offer to purchase the dry erase marker for $5. You write this, you go into the post office, you pay a bunch of extra money to get it overnight delivered. So of course, the next day I wake up, I open my mail, and the first thing that I read is your rejection letter, okay? So I read the rejection letter and I'm like, oh wow, my offer was rejected. He doesn't want the dry erase marker for $5. Let's say two days later, I go to my mailbox and now I see an acceptance letter. I'm like, oh wow, he wants to buy. I guess he did want to accept, right? The question is, do we have mutual assent, right? offer and acceptance. Assume that the offer is valid, assume, assume that the acceptance is valid. Do we have mutual assent from a timing perspective? Right? In this example, right, mailbox rule applies, right? Because none of these exceptions are met. So, did the offeree have the wrong address? No. Did I, the master of the offer, stipulate that the mailbox rule does not apply? Did I say that acceptance was effective upon receipt? No. Is this an option contract? No. Did the offeree send a termination letter before the acceptance letter? No. The first thing that you, the offeree, sent was an acceptance letter. Have I detrimentally relied on a termination letter? No. Right? So none of the exceptions apply. So in this case, right, when you dropped your acceptance letter off into the mailbox, the acceptance was effective at that moment in time. So at this moment, the second that that letter left your fingertips and dropped into the mailbox, we had mutual assent right there, offer acceptance. Assuming the offer was valid, assuming the acceptance was valid, we had mutual assent at that moment it left your fingertips and went into the mailbox, right? The moment of dispatch. Mailbox rule applies. We have offer and acceptance. First element of the traditional enforceable contract is met. Okay? So what's interesting is in this in this timeline, right? If there's no issue of detrimental reliance, then we know without looking at anything else, right? We can basically cover all of this stuff up right? And just look at this. If the first thing that the offeree sends is an acceptance letter, right? None of these other exceptions are at issue. Then we know right there, analysis is over for mutual assent. We have offer and acceptance. As long as nothing else is at play, at this point, analysis is done. Okay? So this is the most basic fundamental understanding of what the mailbox rule is. And I would say this is one of the most commonly tested fact patterns when a contract essay or contract fact pattern is testing the mailbox rule. This is what is liked to be tested, right? Because people want to say that at this moment when the offeror receives that termination letter, they're thinking, how can there be acceptance if the first thing the offeror is receiving is a termination letter? But of course we know because we're machines and we're systematic, we don't care about what the offeror is thinking, right? We know that when that acceptance letter mailbox rule is dropped into the mailbox, it's effective. So at that moment in time, we have mutual assent. Now, of course, what happens if I switch these two events in time, right? Let's say that the X is here and the A is here, right? The termination letter is sent first. So let's run through it again. Let's say that I, the offeror, make you an offer. I offer you to purchase this dry erase. I say, I'll sell you this dry erase marker for $5. And then instead of sending an acceptance letter, the first thing you do is write me a termination letter. You send me a rejection letter. You go and you drop that in the mailbox. 10 minutes later, you realize you made an ex a mistake and you want to accept my offer. So you go back and you write an acceptance letter and then you drop that in the mailbox. Then let's say I am out of town for a week. I get back and I have two letters sitting in my mailbox, right? And I open the first one, they're both from you. I open the first one and it just so happens to be the termination letter. I read that, I put it away, I then I move on, I open the next letter and it's an acceptance letter from you. 
In that fact pattern, do we have offer and acceptance? Do we have mutual assent, right? Well, do any of these exceptions apply? Number one, we need to know, does the mailbox rule apply? And just to make this easier, we can switch these around on the board. So this would be, right, the termination letter was sent first, and then the acceptance letter was sent, right? Just to draw this all out, this is essentially what has now transpired, right? In this case, do we have mutual assent between the parties? Well, let's run through our exceptions. We know that if the mailbox rule applies, then mutual assent happens at this moment in time, right? When the acceptance becomes effective, when it's dropped in the mail, when it's dropped into the mailbox. At the moment of dispatch, the acceptance becomes effective. So if the mailbox rule applies, acceptance is valid at this point in time. If the mailbox rule does not apply, then it's upon receipt and the acceptance becomes valid at this moment in time. So let's run through our exceptions and see which one it is. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.